So yeah, thanks, Natasha. Um, I'm gonna present uh, about um, a presentation about soil soil spectroscopy and uh, more than just soil spectroscopy applications of spectroscopy to soil science and agriculture. Uh, a bit of uh, background. Uh, well, Natasha already mentioned uh, that I'm working in precision agriculture and I'm remote sensing, but, but actually I did my thesis, uh, my PhD thesis in the University of Sydney under uh, the supervision of Alex McBradney, so you may know, um, in soil spectroscopy. Uh, not exactly in applied uh, science in soil, in soil spectroscopy, but in, in all the different uh, topics related with it. I'm a soil science a scientist by um, by instruction. I study uh, in Chile uh, agronomy, and then I specialize in soil science, and I've been working in that thing pretty much for the last 15 years or so. Uh, I joined the Precision Agricultural Laboratory in 2016, as, as mentioned, and now I'm working uh, with Brett Willen and, uh, and his team in the in the PA lab and also working in the Sydney Institute of Agriculture uh, in parallel. So the outline of this um, of this brief seminar, if you want, uh, I'm just going to present some of the um, some of the some of the history of middle and near infrared spectroscopy. Some of the instruments. Uh, will be reviewed in this presentation and mostly it's focus on applications of, of spectroscopy. I think you can see here. Yeah, excellent. Uh, also, I'm gonna present a bit of uh, X-ray fluorescence. Um, you will see further in the presentation. And as I mentioned before, mainly the, the presentation will focus in uh, applications of soil spectroscopy uh, in science and, uh, and in agriculture. All right, let's start. Um, so, uh, where this thing of spectroscopy, spectroscopy comes from, uh, it comes from uh, many, many years ago when the young Isaac Newton um, discovered uh, in his uh, dark, dark net room, and when he directed a white light through a crystal prism on a wall, uh, separated the seven colors that we know now as a color spectrum. The scientists already knew many of these colors existed, but they believed that the prism itself transformed white light into these colors. Okay, so when Newton refracted these same colors back onto the, another prism, they formed into a white light. So he transformed, he took all the colors from the white light, and then he, he took all the, he took them back into the white light. So that then, then people started to think that the white light actually contained many different spectra. And he uh, wrote his book uh, many years ago, many years uh, after the, that discovery in, uh, in his treatise, Optics, in 1704. Um, the principle of spectroscopy was, uh, and how we use it today, it was, um, it was, a, it was, discovered or it was um, initiated by the John Henry Lambert and August Beer. These two guys over here, I'm just going to put these drawing things. Okay, so he's Lambert and he's Beer. But uh, many years before they discovered the law, this guy over here uh, in, a, in a vacation in Portugal, uh, he did, he saw that uh, while looking through a red wine, he saw that the light was passing through the red wine to the cup of red wine, and uh, and the 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 light that was passing was less if the red wine was more uh, had had more body, if you want. So then they uh, created this or this they they started this idea of the concentration of a liquid or of or an object, it's proportionally related to the amount of light that passes through that uh, object. And that's how uh, pretty much spectroscopy started. 
as a, as a science, as a, as a science. Now in uh, 1820, uh, Sir William Herschel discovers what uh, we know, we now know as infrared radiation. Um, the infrared radiation, it's pretty much the middle, the near and the far red uh, spectroscopy. And uh, how did he find out? It was with this uh, very, very smart experiment, if you want. He took the same principles of Newton and he took a prisma and he divided the, the white light into a spectrum. But he also said, what if we measure beyond what we can see? So he took, if we see the spectrum in here, it, it goes from, from blue, yellow, red, and he put some thermometers outside the visible region. And the thermometers were, uh, were marking a, a, difference, a difference in temperature. So he hypothesized that the that this spec, that, that there were even more uh, colors, if you want, outside of the visible part of the spectrum. He back then called it radiation caloric rays, and as a as a nice fact, he was not just a, well, he was an astronomer, but he was also a, a music composer. So now this is this is one of the symphonies that he created. Anyway, so it was 1860 when uh, Gustav Robert Kirchhoff and Robert Wilhelm Bunsen, uh, they, were, they were pretty much good friends in Germany. Uh, they set up the principles of analytical chemistry based on spectral observations. So say they decided to use all this previous knowledge about how light interacts with matter and they started basically sampling with light uh, different uh, different uh, compounds, different, uh, and then they basically form in the first spectral libraries, if you want. Anyway, so we were talking about the the infrared part of the spectrum, right? Um, and uh, back then, they were they knew about the visible part of the spectra, about the infrared part of the spectra, about and about the other side, the the ultraviolet. Uh, Part of the spectrum. So this will be the regions where we these presentations this presentation will uh, will have a framework. Okay. So we're going from short wavelength, which is the ultraviolet. Uh, sorry, this is the opposite. So it's more energy in the ultraviolet and uh, less energy in the infrared. Okay. So. Uh, if we go into the from the ultraviolet to the infrared and to the near infrared or to the far infrared, we go in at the we uh, we have different kind of interactions of light in matter. Okay, so in the UV region, uh, the light breaks um, uh, bounds if you want. In the visible part of the spectra, they have a uh, different uh, bending and uh, stretching and uh, different ways that the, the molecules react and in the NIA they have a different some other some other uh, reactions or some other um, uh, your reactions if you want uh, and this is this is a crucial thing because um, knowing that in different parts of the different different uh, quality of light reacts in a different way of matter then the analysis will be different. So the analysis of, let's say, middle infrared spectroscopy will be different than the analysis in the near infrared part of the spectrum, and also in the analysis of the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Okay, but this is the important thing that you. So you have a framework. We have different parts of light. They have different frequencies. They have different energies, and they they uh, the the matter reacts in different ways depending the type of wave that we are treating. Uh, so, um, knowing that in the first years of research in spectroscopy, they noticed that in the middle infrared of the spectra, the middle, the middle infrared part of the spectra, the peaks or, um, or how light was absorbed or reflected uh, was a reflection, literally, of the fundamentals of matter. 
So let's say this peak will have a direct relation, let's say, with a car like calcium carbonate, a compound, a specific compound will have a single peak. And this is crucial, you will see, you will see after. And the, in the near infrared part of the spectra, this is a little bit blurry. So we have the fundamental peaks, but also we have different combinations or harmonics. So each each of these peaks have is a contribution of many factors. So we will see that near infrared spectroscopy started later than the studies in middle infrared spectroscopy. Uh, and why is that? Because near infrared spectroscopy, we need we need to analyze different different uh, different peaks at the same time. So the computational uh, uh, power it's uh, it's uh, it's small, so it, it wasn't until until the 60s when we had the power of uh, of computing that uh, that the near infrared spectroscopy started uh, started to actually have some results. Um, and this guy over here, this is Carl Norris. He's the father, if you want, uh, of uh, NIR spectroscopy or near near infrared spectroscopy in his paper, Determination of Moisture Content of Seeds, using near infrared spectro uh, spectroscopy. Uh, he basically using a computer and the knowledge from near infrared spectroscopy, he could predict the moisture of uh, different seeds. And a funny fact is uh, that paper was written three years before the, the famous picture of uh, Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee in 1965. So he was, uh, he was famous first. Anyway. So we're going into um, into the analysis of near infrared spectroscopy and how this can be used in uh, in soil science. And um, this is a classic paper of uh, 1964, two years after uh, the paper of Carl Norris, where uh, they found in funnily enough in the Newtonia silk loam series of the United States that's a uh, that's uh, soil types in the United States, they find out that at different moisture contents, uh, the NIR spectra, so as, uh, just to remember, the NIR part of the spectra goes from the visible region, which is around 390 nanometers, so we are here in the 500 nanometers, or micrometers if you want, nanometers, to uh, the 2500 nanometers. Okay, so that this is the NIR part of the spectrum, the NIR region. Um, so they found out that the soil moisture uh, in in in, uh, in different parts of the spectrum was related, not necessarily directly related, but it was related with the with the soil moisture in soils. Okay, so and they found out that thing, and they say, well, it's it's a very NIR spectroscopy is a very cheap way of uh, and a very fast way to measure uh, the quality of soils and this is related with soil moisture and soil moisture of course is one of the key factors in agriculture. They also found that the organic matter had uh, the different contents of organic matter had its own effect in the in the near infrared uh, spectra of uh, of soils. So we have this, that this is a, this is the check, which is like a, a sample soil. And once the organic matter is oxidized, we have a different uh, spectra. Uh, so, or oxidized or, or uh, respirated if you want. So if the loss of organic matter will have a direct impact over, uh, over its spectrum. So that was NIR spectroscopy, but by the time that NIR spectroscopy, uh, they were doing these um, this, uh, this findings, the, as I mentioned before, the, um, the advances in middle infrared spectroscopy, which goes from uh, after, if you want. So you have from, from 400 nanometers to 2,500 nanometers. After that thing is the middle infrared part of the spectrum. Okay. So if, it, if you imagine the NIR should be somewhere here, and then we continue with the middle infrared part of the spectrum. Um, 
the studies in middle infrared spectroscopy were much more advanced. So they already had an idea of the different peaks and the different compounds that they were present. And if, if, you, if you remember, middle infrared part of the spectra works with the fundamentals of matter. So each peak will have a direct relation with a specific compound. And, uh, and well, in the ESS FTIR, that it's a, it's a Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, commonly known as middle infrared spectroscopy. So they found out that the the different uh, the different uh, the different bonds, different compounds, were had had a relation in uh, in this middle infrared spectroscopy. So they were creating more or less a spectral library of uh, of the different things that you can find with middle infrared spectroscopy. And it was not until 1968 when in Aberdeen, in Scotland, uh, they were interested in uh, in the minerals that. Sorry, I'm gonna. <laughs> Say a bit. Uh, they were interested in the um, in the minerals that are created in soils, the ones that give the most functionality to soils. And these are well the well-known smectites, elites, montmorillonites, etc. Uh, so they were finding all right. So what if we uh, use infrared spectroscopy to assess clay minerals? And they found out something that we use, and we'll see in the next slides, uh, we, we use, uh, there were some, there are some publications that are 2019 that they use the same, the same concepts. So they found out in the middle infrared part of the spectra that the colonite, for example, had this, uh, this shape, if you want, as um, the Batman had, like the, the ears of Batman. So if you see those ears, this peaks over here in the around the region three three thousand and five hundred and three thousand and six hundred. You find those little two peaks. That's that in, uh, involves the presence of colonite, and uh, and also the elite has a different uh, a characteristic shape, and the montmorillonite, uh, which is a which is an, a cracking clay, if you want, uh, has also its own shape. So we could recognize the presence of these minerals just by seeing the spectra reflected. Okay, so uh, if we remember the first slides when I talked about the B. Lambert's law, the power, uh, they proposed that the light was direct, directly, the light that passed through a, through a media was directly related to the concentration of the media. Now that happens mostly in liquids and in homogeneous solutions, as wine, for example. But soil is far from being an homogeneous body. And this rule doesn't apply to every single uh, property of soils. Okay, so in some properties, it's possible to create a univariate calibration. So let's say if we have a certain, a certain uh, reflectance in one peak, let's say in the middle infrared part of the spectrum, we can, we can say, all right, that level will be one gram per kilo of organic carbon, let's say. That's a bit too much, like one milligram per kilo of organic carbon, that, that would be more accurate. Uh, and, and then if the spectra increases, let's say twofold, we will have two, and then threefold, we will have three. That only happens in some cases, and we call that a univariate calibration. Uh, and this is one of the cases. For example, it's um, this is a this is a study in uh, in Iran, I think. Yeah, and uh, and they were using basically univariate calibration, uh, finding um, different absorption related to different uh, different amounts of gypsum. So univariate calibration remember that thing because now now we're going to see something a little bit different but univariate calibration means if the spectra is one the property is one if the spectra is two the reflectance is two the property increases twofold etc however and this uh this is the problem of soils they're not homogeneous they're highly heterogeneous uh, 
this power beer lambe law is not always absurd because because of the scattering effect uh, you would usually know about this uh, we heard about this scattering effect which basically the light hits the soil and then hits every single pore and every single particle in the soil and it uh, and it gets distortion okay so for example um, this is these are percentage of organic matter we have from zero percent to twelve percent the the increase in organic matter is not proportionally uh, related with the increase in absorbance in this case or reflectance as, as the opposite okay so we need another kind of calibration we need a multivariate calibration uh, and and that's that's one of the main reasons why near infrared spectroscopy uh, got more popular or or started to be more um, study in the 60s because then we have computers and we can do these multivariate calibrations. Uh, what are the problems with the multivariate calibrations? The spectra is highly correlated. So what I mean by correlated is it's um, this region over here will have always a shape. So this this wavelength will have a very close correlation with the one next to it and so on. So it's, it's highly correlated. And we can have more variables than the number of samples. If we see this spectra, this is not a line, as we see. This is a digital signal. So we don't have continuous values. We only have values every a certain amount of nanometers. In the normal spectrometers, we'll have about two nanometers of um, of, the, of uh, resolution, if you want. Uh, so. This line will be a like more like a dotted line. Okay, that's that's why the number of variables, which are the wavelengths, are higher than the number of samples. In here we have three samples, but we have a, a thousand and something variables. Okay, the number of wavelengths in this digital signal. Anyway. Uh, so some solutions of the problem of uh, multivariate calibration is basically reducing reducing the dimensions of x, x as the target variable, uh, via calculation of latent variables. This sounds very technical, but the principle uh, on this thing is the principal component of the composition uh, that was created in the 1800s. It's a statistical method of reducing the amount of variables. It's just a mathematical uh, procedure, but it was only possible to solve until the 60s when we had computers. Anyway, so how we predict a particular property out of the spectra using multivariate calibration with a, this black box that we call, well, black box for the for most of the people, but, uh, but it's basically a, a dimensional reduction which is a PCA, a PLS, a partial least square regression, uh, to the, the target bar. Okay? So we have linear multivariate methods, PLS, or machine learning methods that is the state of the art now that we're using regression trees, random forest, or convolutional near networks, and all these machine learning methods that are um, happening now. But they all share the same concept. A bunch of variables try to predict single target um, variable which in our case it's organic carbon it's ph it's clay content it's sand content etc all right so as we see uh, it was only since the 60s 70s when we were able to produce these models and by the moore's law that uh, each year the computing power increases uh, twice or it's exponential because this is a lower in the scale uh, then we can process much more data uh, much more efficiently so now to create a machine learning uh, method for creating for predicting let's say uh, uh, content of uh, phosphorus in soils we can take all the spectra and transform it very easily because if we have the computing Okay, so knowing that we have the information from spectra, uh, 
and knowing that we can process uh, all these variables and we can have a cheap and fast and accurate way of predicting soil properties, will this uh, reflectance analysis replace soil extractions? And that was a question that was made about 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, yeah, 20, 20 years ago. Uh, and yes, like in some, in some, you will see in some laboratories, uh, the, for example, the particle size analysis or the texture, it's uh, it's given by the MIR uh, by MIR predictions, and that's a common thing. Here we have a table of the different uh, the different performance of mere, uh, middle infrared uh, diffuse <laughs> reflectance uh, spectroscopy, so middle infrared spectroscopy on different uh, on different compounds okay, so we know that we can predict and, and I, I'm going to ask you to look in this part of the the table the training set is one thing but you all you always need to look for the validation set okay so the, a model will perform good or bad based on its performance in the validation set okay so we have for example clay we can predict relatively accurately with a 0.86 uh, R square. Uh, uh, Titan exchange capacity is even better. Uh, total nitrogen, it's possible to predict. However, uh, well, some people, many people actually, it's um, looking for a way of predicting nitrates or soluble nitrogen. Uh, and we can see that it's not incredible, okay? And why is not incredible? Because the nitrate is very soluble. Uh, so mm -hmm. the content of nitrogen will change in different parts of the soil. Uh, and it's and it makes it very hard to predict. So then you have this table. I think you can you can keep this uh, this presentation, see it later, and you have all these uh, these values. This was in 2009, so now the values, these predictions will be a bit better, but it's a good reference anyway. Okay, so applications. Um, this is one example of a study made in the whole Australia by uh, Rafael Vizcarra Rosel. He's a, he's a soil scientist. He studied here in the, in the University of Sydney and then he moved to Cairo and now I think he's working in Perth. Um, and he took all these samples uh, from around Australia and he basically applied the concepts that I showed you before. He said, all right, we have different diagnostic peaks. You can recognize this, uh, this Batman, this inverted Batman uh, face. So, and if you remember, we have the near infrared part of the spectra right next to the middle infrared part of the spectra. So these are the different uh, signatures of uh, kaolinite, smectite, anilite. So he took all the samples and uh, made a procedure saying, okay, we're going to use a multivariate and, uh, approach to measure the amount of smectite, kaolinite, or elite in these different samples. And then through a digital soil modern, modeling approach, he created what we have now as the as a high resolution content of uh, the proportion of different clay minerals in Australia. This was uh, released in 2011. I think it's it's public uh, available. So you have uh, you have the different contents, and of course these three clay minerals have the, their own properties. Like they make soils have this self mulching. If you have a more two to one. Uh, clay minerals, etc. So that like, you have an idea of how different uh, clays are distributed in Australia. And this just using soil spectroscopy. Sorry. Okay, so we have this this is another example. This is a, this is a paper of Anna Orta. Uh, this researcher, she's uh, she's from Portugal. She came in 2015 to Sydney University. She was here. And she made a study about um, about in, about uh, measuring uh, soil contamination. So we are here in the middle infrared power spectrum. So this is from 4,000 
centimeters to minus one, or if you see it as nanometers, it's 2,500 nanometers, and then it goes to 16,000 nanometers second. So we have in the middle infrared part of the spectrum, uh, and we see that we have the, a diesel, a sample of pure diesel. We have this peak, and this peak will be found pretty much following uh, Henry Lambert and the law, uh, uh, a direct, more or less direct relation with, um, with the concentration of the diesel in different soil groups. Okay? So we have a way of measuring contamination in soils just by using light. Um, this is another example. Um, this is the same the same thing. It's uh, but it's a uh, it's a study made two years ago or three years ago uh, by Dr. Uh, Dr. Ng. <laughs> uh, she just graduated uh, from Sydney Uni as well, and uh, she did a study about looking for the different uh, signatures of different components. Uh, different uh, contaminants in soil and they found out the same the same peaks and but now it was, she was trying to basically assess uh, via light models that would predict the amount of petroleum in soils and then we have different approaches of multivariate calibrations here we have uh, this is one this is one principal uh, partial lead square regression which uses this is the number of uh, number of variables used in the model so it's 180 variables used in the model we have a 0.89 r square however if we use a machine learning method we can use uh, less variables so uh, we have five variables compared with 180 and uh, the 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 performance of the model is a bit better. Uh, this is mainly for, for example, if you want to predict on the go, let's say using a phone or using like some kind of software, then a, a, a lighter model will be more effective. Uh, and this also reflects about the importance of the different peaks. So five variables, uh, with only five variables, you were able to have a good idea of how this uh, diesel is uh, is affecting the, the spectral signature. All right, so that was uh, on mere mid infrared spectroscopy, and we have now as well as some of the studies that we're doing in Sydney Uni uh, and in the Precision Agriculture Laboratory. This is a study of, made by uh, Dr. Edward Jones. Um, he is working in the in the laboratory as well. And we found that, well, it's the, this, the standard uh, way of measuring near infrared spectroscopy. It's uh, using this instrument. This is around 60,000 uh, American dollars, so it's about 90,000 Australian dollars. And uh, it's pretty much de facto global standard, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent instrument. However, it's a bit expensive for if you want to use it. There's this uh, new uh, spectra, well, a spectrometer, uh, spectrometer that it's, uh, it's in the market now. It's around 4,000 Ks. And it measures uh, on, not from the visible part of the spectra, but remember the, the visible part of the spectra starts around 290, I think, or no, 390. So we have from 350 to 2500 the ASD and the neo spectra goes only in the near infrared part of the spectrum. Okay, so we have the visible near infrared, and the neo spectra we have only the near infrared part of the spectrum with a difference of many, many thousand dollars. So we the study was basically checking how good this spectra is predicting the same properties that we're usually predicting with the, with the de facto. And um, yeah, that was the study, comparing commercial available spectrometers. So the samples were picked, uh, there are 390 samples that were covering some, uh, some parts of New South Wales and the north of Victoria. Uh, and they tested uh, 
five different properties, place and pH, total carbon and cation exchange capacity. And we found out that it's not bad at all. Okay, so even though the the, the results were better for the ASD, for the new spectra, it's uh, it's it's pretty good considering the price uh, of the instrument. The same results for pH and total carbon. We know that in total carbon the predictions will be much better uh, because of the literature that knows that we have seen that thing over the years. But uh, these are certainly good uh, results considering that this technology is it's, uh, it's available out there and it's cheap. And same results for CEC. What else? So uh, we found out that um, you can detect some uh, contaminants. Uh, you can detect some, you can predict some different soil properties using multivariate methods. And uh, but the, what about the effect of water? So water has uh, an incredible effect, and we saw it from before. The soil moisture, one of, one of the first studies of uh, power in in the U.S., they found out a relation between the spectral signature and the moisture content. So how can we deal with this thing? And uh, sorry. So. Uh, this is a study of uh, Professor Boriman Minasne. He is, uh, he's a professor here in Sydney Uni. And he, he found out he used this uh, external parameter optimization, uh, orthogonalization. Uh, it's a statistical methodology that basically takes the effect of water out of the equation. So we can use uh, moist samples, this, the spectra from moist samples, to predict properties as if they were dry. So this is uh, this is some of the results that he presented uh, back then. This this research was I think in 2009, if I remember well. So so we here we have a prediction of uh, in circles air dried in uh, in uh, fill in a black black uh, little diamonds in 12% uh, of uh, moisture and uh, triangles in 9% of moisture. So the wetter, the less accurate the prediction. So that's a big problem because if we want to use these instruments in the field, you will never find a dry sample in the field unless it's the first thin layer. But if we want to predict, if we're going to predict properties in depth, in situ, that will certainly be a problem. So he created this algorithm, and uh, and the algorithm is free, so it's, it's really really available. It's a uh, it's a bit complicated if you if you want to uh, use it because it's it's written in in R in programming language, but certainly uh, doesn't require much much of the knowledge, uh, and the algorithm basically, as I said before, removes these little parts of the spectra that were influenced by water. And then we can use it in a normal, let's say, partially square calibration or a normal machine learning uh, calibration. And then we can have a model. And these are the results of the model. So once the spectra was processed through this uh, orthogonalization, then we have uh, predictions, relatively good predictions in soil, uh, in moist soils. All right. So that was uh, the part of. Uh, near infrared and mid infrared spectroscopy and now I'm going to show you a video that I know that the audio won't work <laughs> so what I'm going to do is, um, is just put the video and show you I'm just going to keep it quiet because apparently and no one can hear anyway so this video uh, shows the first uh, mission uh, lunar mission made by humans. Of course, this video is not for the moon. It's not, not on the moon, it's like, probably it's an asset. Uh, but what they were doing is trying to assess the properties, not, not of soil, because in the moon, I would doubt that you have soil. That's a philosophical question. It's a, because soil is a, it's a, it's a, 
it's a reflection of different factors. Yeah, all right, so you're not gonna enter into that thing. So uh, this, this uh, instrument was basically describing, assessing the different properties. And one of the, one of the instruments that this, uh, this uh, module had, this, this was created by the Russians, one of the instruments was a RIFMA, and that's a, that's pretty much an X ray, an XRF uh, spectrometer. Uh, and the, the principle of X rays, it's it's a bit different, uh, but in the in terms of what the res, the results that we're obtaining, it's pretty much the same thing. So let's remember MIR, middle infrared spectrometry. We had uh, elemental peaks that were related with different substances. In X-ray fluorescence, you have the same thing. So a single peak will relate to a single element in this case, and they were there will be different elements. Okay, so and the elements that are more they are, they are more interesting in terms of uh, soil studies are the heavy metals. So and heavy metals are are uh, well detected, for example, lead in here, zinc, and so on. Okay, so XRF, same principles uh, than MIA, different different physics behind, but we have a single peak, a single element, so we have a concentration and it's ready to use. Um, okay, so this is another study that try to merge these two concepts, this NIR, visible NIR spectros uh, spectroscopy with uh, a portable, that's why the P, a portable X-ray fluorescence spectrometer uh, and take the best of two worlds. We have the NIR spectrometer that would be able to, for example, detect different clay minerals. And then we have the XRF that is able to detect heavy metals. Okay. Uh, this study was made by Dr. Liana Posa. Uh, she is currently working in the Precision Agriculture Laboratory. And basically, she used a portable X-ray um, in order to find different uh, heavy metals. And this, this study was made in, in the Sydney Basin. And she found out that averaging uh, this, the results I mean, uh, taking the information from the IR plus the information from the XRF, the predictions were much better. So if you want, the more, the merrier. So if you have more information, well, the results will be better. Okay. This instrument is it's quite expensive. Uh, however, considering the, the impact, that, uh, the, the, the speed that it has and the amount of samples that you can take is cost effective. And we will see another example later. And I think we, yeah, so I'm gonna go a bit faster because I've been talking a lot and I still have like some some other things to show. Um, okay, and we we saw that the results are, are much better. And these are uh, in uh, and uh, in the results after the digital soil mapping uh, of the samples. We found out that the, this is this is the Sydney Basin, well, the Sydney City. We found that the inner west uh, suburbs are, well, probably highly contaminated by uh, lead, and and that's that's expectable, uh, expected as as the as the paint of the houses was the, uh, was full of lead back then, and uh, well, that of course I like, alleviated too. So. Anyway, um, I think I can. Yeah, I'm gonna skip then the last the last uh, talk because I want to focus on this one. So, uh, what are the benefits of having middle infrared spectrometry and near infrared spectrometry and XRF? Because uh, is uh, what we call uh, the soil data crisis. To take a soil sample, it's highly time consuming and money consuming, of course, because you need someone to pay someone to basically go there, take the sample, 
analyze the sample, etc. So there's a lot of money involved. And uh, the spectral will probably offer a great solution uh, for getting more data at a cheaper and a cheaper cost and, and more and in less time. So um, there was well there was this publication spectral sort analysis and inference systems. And what is an inference system? It's basically predicting with the spectra one property and when with that property predicting some other property and so on. So we can have from a single spectra many different soil properties. Okay. And with a combination of two concepts. First, the spectral modeling that we observed before, that we reviewed before, that we have univariate calibrations and multivariate calibrations. And on the other hand, the pedal transfer functions. And a simple pedal transfer function, for example, will be it's just a simple formula that is observed through time, like it's they are in the literature, most of them. So we have, for example, the wilting point will be a formula saying 0 0.01 times the sand content plus some coefficient times the seal content and some coefficient times the uh, clay content. Okay, so we have a way of predicting a difficult to measure property with some other easy to uh, get properties. And what if we can predict clay with the spectra and silt with the spectra and then predict will coefficient? That will be possible in theory. So it was possible that the, this was uh, this app it's created by Dr. Eric Jones. He's from the Precision Agriculture Laboratory. This uh, this uh, app, it's uh, it's publicly available, I think. And he basically, with a set of pedal transfer uh, pedal transfer functions and spectral models, was able to create, for uh, for example, a model of predicting available water content at the very end by predicting in a cascade mode the different properties with just the spectra. Okay. So this is one, one example. So we have in the, if we are able to predict, I'm just going to go here, if we are able to predict total carbon and all these properties from the spectra, then we can predict some other properties and so on until we predict the available water content. So from a single spectra, we can uh, predict many others. Okay. And of course, with the uh, with the confidence intervals for each property. This study was, uh, well, this, these are soil profiles. So we have, these are predicted by the spectra and then we have different different properties predicted uh, with the pedal transfer functions. Okay, so we have this profile view and, uh, and we can, for example, predict available water, uh, solid soils, so et cetera, for different soil profiles. And they made, of course, a study that then you mix all these things so you can predict using the NIR spectra and using the XRF uh, at different depths, using the EPO or this uh, way of taking the water out of the spectra in C2, predicting many different properties, doing the spectral inference and then predicting some other properties and give some, uh, some uh, advice in the field. And I think I'm going to stop there, Natasha, if you can hear me, because I guess I do have 10 more minutes. And if I use those 10 more minutes, I'm just going to use the whole time for questions. All right, Mario, I will stop you there. Thank you so much. I'm just going yeah. to <laughs> unmute everybody. And if you have a question, can you please um, start by introducing yourself um, and then ask a question? So I think I uh, know it's not unmuting. Unmute all. Oh. Nope. Okay, how do I can just keep going? <laughs> uh, here we go. No. I'm having some technical difficulties. So if you do have a question for Mario, please type it into the chat box because I seem to be able to unable to unmute you. Uh, I'll just monitor. Let me try again. 
No, it's not working. <laughs> and there's can, no questions can, coming um, through. So if you do want to keep going, Mario, I'll, I'll let yeah. you finish up and um, I'll just give people that, that last 10 minutes to type any of their chat, any of their questions into the chat box. Yeah, they can send me a question via, via email. <laughs> not a problem. Actually, I can, that'll be useful because I can present some other things that are, we're doing now. Anyway. So should I go? Yes, please yeah. continue. Hey, excellent. So um, this is one of the latest things that we're doing. This is made by Dr. Vanessa Pino. Uh, she's a uh, Chilean as well. She's working in, uh, as a postdoc in the Sydney Institute of Agriculture, and she's using XRF uh, to assess the amount of heavy of metals or of nutrients. Uh, that we need in our nutrition. So it's the same concept. So um, so all this study starts from the hypothesis that since we are uh, increasing the yields in wheat, uh, we may be uh, diluting, if you want, uh, the amount of uh, essential nutrients in wheat. So if we had 10 grains of iron, let's say, in one kilo of wheat. Now we will have more like two kilos of wheat, but then we have proportionally less iron. So maybe we can have this hidden hunger. Uh, so the whole idea of the experiment is, uh, is measuring, is using XRF spectroscopy to detect these peaks and to assess the amount of uh, iron in, uh, in wheat. And uh, and this well, this this had like pretty good results. Like well, this this uh, study was uh, done by one of our students, Sandra Joy Paustan, in uh, in our Narvai uh, experimental station. And now it's it's getting commercial, so we're going to do it in different other sites. And we saw that the results are encouraging. So we have a positive detection of different uh, essential nutrients like iron, zinc, magnesium, calcium, etc. Uh, just using spectral signature. Okay, and in the future, hopefully, we're going to see what's the effect of the different soil type or different wheat varieties. So uh, so we can add value to the product uh, to wheat product. Wheat is a staple uh, crop in Australia, um, but uh, but this can add extra value to the product that we are producing. And this is the last one because I, I actually don't have more slides. And this is one of the one of the things that we're doing now, considering this removal of uh, soil moisture from the spectra. So this is I took this picture a few few mom moments ago. And this is a spectrometer that it's, uh, it goes into this, uh, this um, drillery uh, probe. And we can have observations and predictions in real time uh, of different soil properties. This was tested in Australian soils and this probe didn't bend. That's important because the clay content in here is incredible. So yeah, we have this uh, this little window here that it's uh, it goes to a fiber optic connected to a spectrometer. The spectrometer is that one over there, and uh, so yeah, now we have the possibility of measure in real time a set of different properties and basically do soil surveys on the go with all information being uh, captured in a in a nice format, not like the old times, like you go there, dig the hole, send it to a lab, take the results, write them down, etc. So now we can have all in one. And that'll be it. <laughs> Thank you very much.